Welcome to The Lover's Hole, where we're rereading the Aubrey Matron series of our favorite author, Patrick O'Brien. You're with Mike. And with Ian. And we are making our way through the nutmeg of consolation. Ian, bring us up to date here. With great pleasure, Mike. Last week, a big dramatic chapter last week, we had the Cornelie chasing our ship, the Nutmeg, into the Sally Babu Passage. They were exchanging chaser fire. There were even occasional French broadsides. Jack's cunning plan of deception had failed because the Cornelie pumping water constantly was too slow and because the tide was too strong to reach the end of the passage before daylight. A squall came along. The Cornelie had snuck up in a squall towards the end of the passage and inflicted some serious mast and sail damage on the Nutmeg just before we sighted other sails. They were the surprise, Ta-da! a letter of Mark Consort and two American prizes, and their presence literally turned the tide. The Connolly sank as she tried to flee back through the passage, and Tom Pullings, God bless Tom Pullings, Pullings rescued the survivors, including Christy Pallier's nephew, Jean-Pierre Dumenil. That was last week. So, Mike, what have we got coming up this week? Well, we've got Jack writing to his bride, Sophie, He's worried about Stephen's lost fortune. We've got a farewell dinner with differences and similarities in some of the naval officers and their legal attitudes. And to be honest, not all of them fare well. There are polar bear stories, unbalanced humours. There's the return of the Chelenk. We've got people catching up in the mizzen shrouds. Well, who wouldn't want to do that? We've got Shakespeare on the subject of ageing and a big transaction toasted with the best Sicilian juice. We also have a great interview for you this week with our special guest, Neil Buttery, who is going to talk to us about food, drink and dining habits in the Regency era. Of course, with a generous investment of time on the subject of puddings. Love so Mike, puddings. <laughs> oh, we love puddings. Mike, before we get to the puddings, let, let's start with the appetizer. Jack is pen in hand writing to his bride. Oh, we love these serial letters. This in, in fine Jane Austen style, we always find out what's going on. And Jack is telling her about welcoming Jean-Pierre aboard after shaking his hand rather than taking his sword, praising the way Jean-Pierre had fought his ship after the Cornelis captain had died. And he asked Sophie to be sure to contact the Christie cousins, Jean-Pierre's relatives, to let them know that Jean-Pierre is quite unhurt. He confirms that one of the nutmeg's shots had indeed hauled the Cornelie so that she had just been able to stay afloat this whole chase by pumping day and night. But when she turned into the head sea with all her men exhausted from this big battle, you know, she just would no longer swim. So uh, Jack recounts that they've now moved all the ships out of the passage into a sheltered road. They've got 60 fathoms of water underneath and the, the nutmeg, the surprise, the Triton, that heavy letter of Mark commanded by Horseflesh Gotham that we talked about last time. Mm -hmm. This this former Navy post captain who was court-martialed for a false muster. We'll talk more about that later. And these two American prizes all together there. And Jack's recounting to Sophie that these prizes are all the more splendid because they had captured some other ships. They weren't big enough to kind of send in with prize crews. So they had taken all their holds, emptied them out, and they've got all these furs and sea otters and all these other wonderful things from other vessels stuffed into these American prizes here. Well, in addition to these two big merchantmen that they have there, you know, he tells her that the Surprise's very successful crew also included a number of Nantucket and New Bedford whalers that had already been sent into South American ports. Now, Jack's particularly glad about you know all these prizes, all the prize money that will come from it, because he thinks that this is going to uh, help Stephen going forward here. So Jack's looking out the surprise's stern window. He sees the final repairs being taken undertaken on the nutmeg. And he looks over, he sees this magnificent table for 14 uh, that Killick has sent. So he's anticipating a big farewell dinner they have coming up shortly. And God bless Sophie for providing us the opportunity that we get from a little bit of letter writing. Jane Austen was no fool. First of all, we get to do a bit of catch up, a bit of a bit of basil exposition. Second of all, we get through this writing to kind of lean in and figure out what's on the minds of our protagonists. 
So Jack's been reporting and catching up with Sophie. Stephen is busy with his own bit of letter writing, but it gives us more of a glance into how he's feeling and thinking right now. Sitting writing in the same room, he tells Diana that he's tired of being a solitary bee, as he calls himself. I have no words, he says, to express my longing to hear from you again, to learn that you and perhaps our daughter are recovered well and happy. And so far as material things affect happiness, it may increase yours as it has increased mine to know that if these prizes reach port, our economy may be somewhat less sparse, pinched, anxious and grey. And Mike, it's, it's a very downbeat, very kind of saddening passage of, it, of him writing to Diana here. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that sparse, pinched, anxious and grey is not just their economy. I think that's a little bit about Stephen reflecting on how he's feeling right now and his mood. The mood is still positive, however, with uh, with Jack writing his letter to Sophie. He says, just as Stephen is thinking, Jack is writing to Sophie too, that these prizes could be a bit of relief since Stephen gets the largest share of the prize fund as the owner and fitter out. But he says he suspects that the prize money is only going to go a small way toward recovering his fortune. Jack doesn't know how Stephen's finances stand. When he heard Smith and Klaus had failed, he had hurried over to see Stephen and said, He's never regretted anything more than telling Stephen to move banks and that he hoped and prayed that Stephen had not followed his advice. He meant to say that they'd share purses before and would do so again, but he reports that he'd stumbled over the word and Stephen had kind of cut him off rather coldly and said, no, 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 not at all. It was no great matter. I'm infinitely obliged to you, kind of closing down the subject. Jack reports that Stephen said no more. Jack himself has tried to throw out some delicate hints that Stephen hasn't seemed to notice. And I love this description. This is Jack describing Stephen. He says, With a man Lucifer could not hold a book, bell or candle to for pride, I cannot raise the subject directly. And he goes on and tells Sophie that he's going to ask Stephen to sell him the surprise at the end of the journey. Jack, of course, would love to own it. Jack now is in funds, so is in a position to do so. And he hopes that that will help to keep Stephen economically and spiritually afloat. This uh, bell, book and candle reference here, Mike, that sounds like a big temptation to us to uh, to lift the covers a little bit here. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's another classic Aubreyism. You know, he's combining cannot hold a candle to when, you know, when something yeah. or someone is inferior to something, it said you know, they can't hold a candle to the person that they're inferior to. But here it's cannot hold a book bell or candle yeah. and that book bell or candle is kind of a classic ending algorithm to a uh, catholic excommunications ritual you know dating back to the 8th century wow. and and you find that this book bell or candle becomes associated with all sorts of things miraculous things mysterious things with witches kind of takes on a life of its own uh, there was a book called Bell, Book, and Candle. Uh, it became a play, it became a movie. Uh, the TV series Bewitched, for some of you, I, oh, I'm reaching yeah. back, I know. You know, I, I had a, a pretty strong, adult, you know, I guess it was pre-adolescent crush on Elizabeth Montgomery. That series is really predicated on that book and the, and the assumption behind there. Even Shakespeare used the phrase, put it in the mouth of King John here. It's in the lyrics of Rolling Stone songs, John Lennon songs. Any good witch fans out there will remember it's the name of Cassie's store in that hallmark wow. thing. So, I'm, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big Cassie fan from <laughs> the Good Witch. But put this idea that you know that that Lucifer, you know that that you know Stephen's pride is greater than Satan's, <laughs> the guy who fell from heaven, and to put this excommunication phrase in there, I think I would take this very ominously were we not to realize that this is another Aubreyism. So we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, I, I, I love the references for the generations there. Mike, we get uh, we get the good witch and we get bewitched. Very good. Right. One, 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 <laughs> one for the teenagers and one for the not-so-teenagers. There you go. Oh, fantastic. Well, g going on with this nice kind of Jane Austen touch that we have in the letter writing here, Jack goes on and tells Sophie that he's offered Commander the Nutmeg to Tom Pullings. But more exposition here, since that would involve parting company and escorting these prizes to Batavia, Tom would rather stay with the surprise. So there are preparations underway for a, for this 
forthcoming dinner. And as we are sitting with Stephen and Jack in the cabin here, we witness these plans becoming a little bit unwound, although there are some fixes in place. The soup is burned. That's going to be replaced with some pretty foul portable soup from the sick bay. Jack's breeches are all ink stained. They're going to be replaced with his second best. If this all works out, Jack is going to be able to honour the nutmeg's pennant and honour all of his officers and guests at this magnificent dinner. As the minutes pass towards the dinner, we get Tom Pullings showing up in his magnificent commander's uniform, passing across a letter from Sam, who is Jack's natural son. The black spitting image of Jack, we learned of quite a few books ago, but with an Irish accent. Jack opens up the letter. He's very, very pleased to hear from Sam. Tells Stephen that it's well written, has some Greek in it, and a message for Stephen. And Stephen, with, with a completely straight face, takes a look and says, this is not Greek, this is Irish. Uh, he says, it's a thank you. Uh, the particular blessing is, may God set a flower upon your head. A particular thank you, in fact, for Stephen's intervention with the patriarch on Sam's behalf. Jack, showing ignorance and the usual sort of Aubreyistic insensitivity about Irishness, says, I had no idea the Irish had a writing of their own. And Stephen says, well, we had it long before your ancestors had left their dim Teutonic wood, pointing out that the Irish taught the English the ABC, although, as he remarks, with indifferent success. <laughs> yeah, 15 love to Stephen Maturin. There you go. What well, Jack enjoys reading the rest of this letter from Sam here. And O'Brien tells us that even though Sam is well known and accepted at Ashgrove Cottage, and that Jack's mind is logical in math and celestial navigation, Jack is a lot less logical where kind of laws are concerned. O'Brien writes some, and almost all of those to do with the service, he, meaning Jack, obeyed without question. Others, he transgressed at times and then suffered in his conscience. And with others, he laughed at them. Now, Sam's place in the shifting landscape was obscure. Jack could not feel any easily defined guilt at that remote fornication, and he heartily loved his black popish priest of a boy. But a contradiction still remained, and it would have made him profoundly uneasy to read a letter from Sam while he himself was still writing to Sophie. So we <laughs> this funny way that Jack kind of sees the world and a theme that's going to play out a little bit here, kind of what's our relationship with the laws and our personalities and Very how we good. act here. So, you know, Jack loved the letter. He began to read it again until Killick announced that the nutmeg had lowered a boat. Yeah. Well, in anticipation of these boats coming across here, we've got the surprises officers all gathered, standing around in their uniforms, in their finery, hot and hungry on the quarterdeck. And a little bit pissed, to be honest, that they realise that neither of these two boats are actually headed for the surprise. Finally, at long last, the boats that are headed for the surprise do put off. Killick and his mates arrange the welcoming drinks and delicacies on the captain. The first man that gets welcomed aboard is Goffin, very red-faced, um, he's a post-captain who, as you say, Mike, had been cashiered, that is to say, dismissed from a position of responsibility for this breach of discipline, still wearing his uniform with some trifling changes, it notes here. And Mike, I, I can remember that we said that way back in Reverse of the Medal, Jack really distanced himself from any association with the uniform, didn't want to be seen to be looking for you know merit by association with the uniform, didn't want to even go out with you know, a navy blue coat with the wrong epaulette on would have been a wrong thing for him. Very, very kind of subfusk in the way he dressed. This guy, Goffin's got a very different idea about how to go about wearing some version of his uniform. Goffin salutes the quarterdeck, which is maybe even a presumptuous thing to do. I don't know. Right. And says, how do you do, Aubrey, without a smile? And heads straight for Killick and the food and drinks. And straight away, we've got a pretty clear idea, Mike, of what the, this, this Goffin character is going to be like. He's along there with his nephew. The nephew is a little bit more gracious. And from the nutmeg, we have the officers. We have the, among those, the two French officers. And we have Adams, Reed and Oaks all come aboard. And after drinks, they go into the great cabin and Goffin sets the tone a little bit here, rather unfortunately, by saying, by God, Aubrey, you do yourself proud and walks to the head of the table to sit. And uh, when this is diplomatically pointed out to him that his place is not at the head of the table and that we've got the French officers and we've got, you know, a, a different way of thinking about precedence and, and, and sitting at the table, Goffin takes offense at this. And 
clearly, Jack Blessing, I think, is willing to give Goffin some credit, and he remembers how he had felt rather awkward about how to process uh, the idea of precedence and people trying to be polite to him and this sensation of awkwardness. Goffin, as we'd already heard, has been struck off for keeping false muster, and it's pretty clear from how he carries on and from some of the things that he says that he rather resents this. The offence he describes as having been merely technical, and we learn that in getting to this point, Goffin had been betrayed by his clerk. This is somebody who he had repeatedly kicked and cuffed. And Mike, I think this is where the stories of Goffin and Aubrey start to diverge in our understanding. You know, Aubrey feeling uncomfortable about his lack of status in the Navy, but clearly not somebody to do anybody else down. Goffin, somebody who's quite willing to kick and cuff his way out of a situation. Yeah, very definitely. And and to kick and cuff his way into the situation. It's like right. it, it, yeah, yeah. It, 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 better relations with your clock. You never would have gotten turned in. But no. Right. Well, Goffin going into dinner immediately tries to think of an offensive remark that's not too gross here. And again, as you said, Ian, very different guys, Aubrey right. and Goffin. And, and he has a great opportunity. The soup is terrible. It smells like glue. You know, pullings for the honor of the ship compliments Stephen on the soup. He, he knows this has come from the sick bay. But Stephen, in the meantime, is telling the French officers, don't finish it. They've, they've kind of sucked it up and are going to eat it to be polite. And Goffin, although instead of insulting it, which would have been really easy, has an extra serving, you know. And, and then he loudly tells his nephew, an older man who'd failed to pass for lieutenant, that this is the kind of show you see at the Lord Mayor's banquet or among the commercial gents. So, Ian, tell us about that. He's trying to put Aubrey down. What's what's he actually saying about it? Oh, here? yeah. I mean, you, you might think Lord Mayor's Banquet is like a, a grand association to have. But in the mind of somebody like Goffin, who I think would have been a fan of Lord Clonfort, you know, appreciates the fine things and appreciates the aristocratic touch. The Lord Mayor's Banquet is a very lower middle class thing. All of these kind of commercial gents, the merchants in the city, th- th- this is not a happy association for him. Goffin is thinking, yeah, he'd rather be getting something a bit more refined. And he regards Aubrey as a bit of an Aravist, a bit. Uh, yeah, new money, to use a phrase that might have been on his lips at this point. There you go. Well, Goffin aims us at Aubrey, but Jack is busy laughing at one of his own jokes. So, so he, you know, he misses that. And at the other end of the table, Fielding starts on one of his grandfather's stories about bears from a voyage to the North Pole as a midshipman on the the HMS Racehorse, and Nelson was a midshipman on the other ship in that squadron. And Horseflesh says that we shouldn't be talking about Nelson with French officers in company. It ain't civil, he says. Mm. Well, John Pierre says their withers are unwrung. We have Duguay Truon to name but one. Horseflesh has never heard of him. Jean Pierre says, well, then you have a great treat in store. And he says, a glass of wine with you, sir. A glass of wine all around, says Jack Bumpers now, gentlemen, and no heel taps to Duguay Truon, and may we never meet his like. So Amen. here is this, you know, this horse flesh is jumping in. Jean Pierre is showing a contrasting, you know, gracious behavior, just as Jack has shown contrasting great behavior. Um, and Jack is trying to, you know, unite the table again and get away from this. But we have this reference here. We said, well, there's Nelson on the English side for the for the United Kingdom here. And the French have their own hero. Ian, anything that we know about this guy? Well, we have to reach a bit further back in history than the, the time of Christy Pallier and Cochrane and Nelson. We have to reach back into the uh, late 17th and early 18th centuries. René Duguay-Truin had started as a privateer. He joined the French Royal Navy because it was a, this is pre-revolutionary France. Um, in 1697 as a frigate captain, made it to Commodore and then to Admiral in 1715 and was considered to be one of the best and, according to many, the best of the French naval officers in history. He captured 16 warships, over 300 Dutch and English merchantmen. So in, in our novels timeline, we take it for granted that British ships sweep the waves. But back in the day, with guys like this in charge, the French Navy was pretty formidable as well. He took Rio de Janeiro, the city of Rio de Janeiro, which was considered impregnable in 1711 with 12 ships and 6,000 men right, lined up against seven ships, five forts and 12,000 men. A bit of a Cochrane touch, you might say. Right. Um, he also escaped from an English prison in 1694, get this, by seducing a young woman who sold meals to prisoners. And Mike, that echoes, and I'm sure not coincidentally, 
the Yagiello Aubrey Amaturin escape story in The Surgeon's Mate. So really, really fascinating reference. Really great that the French guests are proud of Duguet Truin. Right. Now, before we move off of the references in this paragraph, uh, this little fleeting phrase here given by the Frenchman who says, our withers are unrung. And this is another one of these things that I had always just kind of galloped past. But there's a reference here as well, right, Mike? Well, and, and gallop is the word for it, too. Yeah. The withers <laughs> refers to a horse's anatomy. It, it's the highest part of a horse's back. It's kind of right at the base of the neck above the shoulders. It's the part that resists the strain of, of the collar that, you know, you kind of have the the withers is, is right at the uh, on the collar as you're, you know, if you've got a horse hooked up or it's right at the front in front of where the saddle is. So when we say the to ring the withers, Back in the day, it meant to stir the emotions or the sensibilities. So Jean Pierre mm-hmm. is saying, you know, you haven't stirred our emotions or sensibilities. You know, Shakespeare's Hamlet says, "Let the gold jade wince, our withers are unwrung." So it's another Shakespearean reference here in the mouth of a Frenchman, again with a horse connection, as we're kind of trying to contrast civil behavior and civil gentlemen with this horse flesh gothin in this dinner here. Well, Jack asks Fielding to continue his story. And he says, now, now, is this the story about Nelson's famous attempt at a bear's skin? Well, you know, that, of course, set me running to go, wait a minute, Nelson's uh-huh. famous attempt at a bear skin? Well, it turns out that in 1773, Nelson, now 14 years old, is this midshipman on HMS Carcass. You know, the boat that's sailing with HMS Racehorse in Fielding's story here. Nelson, um, they're, they're kind of, you know, in the bay there. Uh, Nelson's off kind of hunting for a polar bear and ignoring a signal to return to the ship. He'd spotted this polar bear. He and another midshipman leave. And according to later accounts, he his gun misfired, but he tries to, to club the bear with the butt of his musket. The story continues about Lord Nelson, you know, earning a real reprimand, which he very deeply resented. Uh, and it features Captain Phipps, who later becomes Lord Mulgrave, a college friend of Joseph Banks. So all of these guys kind of mm. feed back into our stories here. And Phipps, as Dr. Matron points out in the dinner, was the first modern European to describe the polar bear and the ivory gall, one of one of Dr. Matron's favorites here. Uh-huh. This is what I think we were expecting, but it turns out that the story Fielding was actually planning to tell was not Nelson's story, uh, and he offers to give just what he calls just the bare bones, bare pun intended, just the bare bones to show there is another side to the creature. And this is a very, very different story as well. In Fielding's really quite heart-rending story, um, some sailors um, ashore in Spitsbergen had seen a female polar bear and her cubs scavenging pieces of walrus blubber from the fire. Uh, The she-bear had carried pieces back to the cubs, and when she came to the last piece, the sailors had shot the cubs dead and wounded the mother severely. She would crawled to the cubs, divided the meat between them, and when they didn't eat, she touched them with their paws but couldn't stir them. She went a few paces away, moaned again, and when they didn't follow, uh, quoting the words of the book here, she returned to them again and with signs of inexpressible fondness, went round one and round the other, pawing them and moaning. Finding at last they were cold and lifeless, she lifted her head towards the men and growled. And several firing together, they killed her too. And Mike, it, it's a horrible story, and... It's not told with any kind of redeeming bit of context uh, or any kind of insight into the teller. It's just laid there for us to, to, you know, juxtaposed with the earlier stories that we've had uh, about Nelson. And you kind of wonder why. Yeah, I, I, I did exactly that, Ian. I mean, you know, we haven't heard the earlier young Nelson story. You know, it's been referred to. And until you do a little research, you don't know that. And I really was stunned. I mean, you know, usually there's a point to why O'Brien put something in there, and it may take a while to get at it. But on this one, I just was not getting it. But coming back, reading the chapter slowly, and then realizing all of these horse references, all of the stories, all of the actions of the characters are all set up as a contrast. And this story about the polar bear comes from the ship racehorse. They're all horse pointing back to horse flesh gotham here. 
So, you know, we've got this hideous mother polar bear and the cubs talking about sort of man's stark humanity in contrast to the Nelson story where, you know, no, no polar bears are harmed. (laughs) And everybody, I think, you know, all these stories point to people pointing out the side of horse flesh's character and behavior that, you know, they disapprove of. And these are all kinds of ways of doing that. And, And interestingly, with all these stories, all these references and everything, they are doing it without making any kind of an uncivilized remark. It's all just storytelling. It's all just phrases. You know, that's kind of an incredible talent that I'm afraid has been lost to the generations, at least I, to this generation. I'm, I'm sad to say, I think you're right, Mike. I think you're right. Huh. Well, it, it makes us kind of stop and pause. And I think it makes the people assembled around the table stop and pause. Uh, Brian says that uh, a decent silence followed. And Stephen then says quietly, Lord Mulgrave was the most amiable of commanders. He it was that first described the ivory gull, and he took particular notice of the northern jellyfish or blubbers. And once again, as you say, Mike, a juxtaposition or a contrast um, with horseflesh and his characteristics. The conversation comes back. Th- thank you to Stephen for doing that most unstephen like thing of rescuing the conversation. Right. That's not normally his style at all. The conversation now resumes. There's a steady hum of talk. Well, be the Marine officer speaking very good French. And Stephen had mentioned to us already that he practices at night in his room, um, speaking it with the Cornelie's third lieutenant. Very nice manners. And while all this is going on, as O'Brien says, from the glum far end came Goffin's voice, loud, somewhat out of control. Well, seeing that many of us are out of favour in Whitehall, I'll give you a toast. Here's to the Navy's black sheep, and may they all soon be whitewashed with the same brush. Which is... A pretty stinky thing to say, really. Anyway, back into the text. They took it remarkably well. Both West and Davidge, and Mike, those are the two people he's talking about as being out of favour with the Admiralty. West and Davidge contrived a smile, and they all drank their wine and drew on every reserve of anecdote or remark about tide, weather, or current. Anything to prevent a silence. Navigating past all these potential awkward moments and navigating past moments that it could have turned into silence were helped along the way. There's a pudding, a great noble spotted dog, we hear. And after the pudding's been served, Jack asks Stephen to explain, before the loyal toasts are drunk, to the French-only speaking third lieutenant, that they're about to drink His Majesty's health and that it's fine for the lieutenant not to join in. And if he decides to, to point out that, as we all know, we, meaning the British officers, are privileged to drink it seated. The French officers, even so, do join in very graciously as Jean-Pierre adds God bless him at the end. They head to the quarter deck for coffee, brandy and farewells. Now, this all seems like an occasion rescued, but Horseflesh Goffin is still not in the right of it. He is obscurely righteous and indignant. And the nutmegs, on the other hand, who are carrying all of the surprises males to count on, are very affectionate in their farewells. And Jean-Pierre's farewell even is loving as he takes his leave of Jack and Stephen. So we get to the end of a meal, Mike. We get a passing reference to pudding. And this seems like a really good moment to share with the listeners a recent conversation we had with an expert on the subject. We're really excited to welcome to the show today special guest, Neil Buttery. Neil is a chef, author and food blogger. We might even label you, Neil, food historian. I don't know. Um, Neil's originally from Leeds in the north of England, now lives in Manchester, specialises in British food from a historical perspective. Cooking, familiar favourites, forgotten dishes, and also food that might have unfairly acquired a bad name. Uh, Neil, welcome to the Lubbers Hole. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So so tell us a bit about yourself. Um Food historian? How, how do you come to be a food historian? It's difficult to kind of pin down when I became a food historian. Am I a food historian? Who knows? Um, I, <laughs> I got into it purely by accident. It came out as really being a hobby stroke distraction from my PhD that I'd started at Manchester University in evolutionary biology. And I really, wow. I'd, I'd been out of academia for quite a few years. I was a little bit scared of that flashing cursor at the top corner of, yeah, <laughs> of the document, you know, you, everyone kind of starts sweating over, over that, writing down the first sentence or the, even the first word. So 
Well, I'd already decided as a bit of a project, I'd cook all the recipes in Jane Grigson's English food because I didn't know about English food particularly. Hmm, okay. Uh, but yeah, a friend of mine just said, well, why don't you blog the recipes as you do them? It'd be good practice for you. And I thought, oh yeah, of course. So I did it, not expecting anyone to read it. Um, it was purely just an exercise. And the risk that someone might read it, I thought, well, that just might up my game a little bit. Yeah. So that's how I got into it. But uh, well, I did my PhD. I got a postdoc in in the US, um, Rice University in Houston. And I was carrying on cooking food, bringing it to work, or inviting people around. And they really liked it. And they were quite surprised. You know, most people in America, I mean, you can disagree with me, but it seemed to me that most people in America never heard of a suet pudding. Oh, no, I think it's very true. I think we can do something about that. (laughs) (laughs) Just the pudding in general, other than that chocolate or vanilla or banana thing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, I'd be inviting people around and they'd they'd be getting a a spotted dick or a jam roly-poly. And everyone loved it. You know, initially they were suspicious because it's unusual food. To, to me, it was everyday food, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, at least culturally, <laughs> although I wasn't necessarily eating suet puddings every single day of my life. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then I thought, you know what? I've cooked, I mean, there's 450 recipes in that book by Jane Grigson. I'd started up a second blog because I wanted to just write essays because I'd really got interested in it at that point and tackle the other home nations in the UK, not just England. And I thought, right, do you know what? I, without realizing it, I've been taught how to cook. Jane Grigson's taught me how to cook. I can cure meat. I can smoke meat. I can make pastry, bread, all these things, stock, you know, things, basic skills that people don't have anymore. And I thought, you know what? I think I could actually make a business out of this. So I planned it all from America, handed in my notice. And August 2012, I'm really bad at remembering dates, but I remember this because it was the London Olympics. Oh, yeah. Uh, And I arrived midway through that, you know, start of August. By the end of August, I was trading in artisan markets. So it was like maybe a three-week period between me getting back from the US to to trading. Um, Because I knew if I stopped, I would chicken out. Yeah. Again, I know myself well. I thought, if I stop and think about this, I'll think of 100 reasons why I shouldn't be doing it. And it's gone from there. The little market stall became a pop-up restaurant at home. I used to stick all my furniture upstairs, bring in tables and chairs and make my house into a restaurant whilst I was looking for, you know, a proper bricks and mortar place. Then I, then I found it. That I went a little bit awry after a couple of years, unfortunately. But by then, I'd done all these years and years of, of writing about British food and the history and the context behind it. And yeah. just at the time that the, the restaurant closed, just by chance and happenstance, really, I mean, it's great, People started inquiring about writing, and I started having ideas about writing. And yeah, and then I started, uh, we, I got my first uh, book published earlier this year, and it's all been very, very exciting and 100% unplanned. When people ask me for advice, I just go, my only advice is to do it because you love it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> nice. Wow. So, you know, we're, we're pretty interested in the Regency era. That's when yeah. these book series takes place. Could you talk a little bit about what's interesting to you about that time from, from your perspective? Well, really, it's about um, Britain being a land of plenty. You know, the British Empire is at full throttle. The Industrial mm-hmm. Revolution is at, is at full throttle. There's a lot of money. There's riches. There is cruelty and exploitation going on. Mm-hmm. I mean, we might have um, got rid of slavery, but that doesn't mean we've got rid of exploitation uh, mm. in the empire and within the country. And for me, really, it's the huge gap. I, I think I'm right. And it's the biggest gap there's ever been in British history between rich and poor during that Regency era. Mm. So what people were eating, so I mean, because that's what I'm ultimately interested in, were very different, more than enough to go around by far, probably several times around, but the food inside the country was not being equally distributed. And whilst people were really lodding it up and filling their faces, there were the poor who were constantly on the edge of starvation or homelessness. So that's kind of how I frame it. It's fun writing about all the big meals, the banquets and the, you know, amazing creations that people had on their tables. But you do have to remember to, um, at least at least every now and again, have a sobering thought about 
how the other half was living at the same time. Yeah, and we get some ideas of that in the novels as well. It, not necessarily always very lavish food, but certainly generous and well-proportioned food for the for what you might call the middle class, the officer class. And we get a good insight into you know, what what it was like eating on the lower deck and what a prospect it was. I mean, people in the books say, "Oh my gosh, what you you spent some time as a lower deck seaman? The food must have been terrible." <laughs> people were really aware that they expected people of humble origins to really be eating the. The, the only barely consumable version of food. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, of course, there's different contexts that you can look in. There's, there's people who are working in factories or in farms. There are yeah. domestic servants, and then there's a hierarchy within domestic servants as well, of course. And then you've got the middle classes. So I wanted to ask, from a culture perspective and a sociological perspective, if mm. we uh, were sitting down to a meal with English or American hosts in, I don't know, 1810 or 1820. Yeah. What what differences do you think we'd notice? And have you got any thoughts about even whether there's differences again between the the, the English British world of dining and the American world of dining at that time? Well, they were fairly similar at that time. Um, I mean, the, the US is the United States of America at this point. It's yeah. not a it's not a British colony. But uh, I, I gathered something know, the, about that. They keep on going on about something about tea and represent it i can't remember yeah, something I, about I, I, tea, I, yeah. I don't know if that ever you caught on did it <laughs> appellation in, what, <laughs> um, indeed uh, but you know the, uh, there's obviously big echoes and there still are big echoes of of british culture and, and, and british food but sit, we're talking about sitting around a meal if we assume it's maybe a you know more than maybe just your average meal mm-hmm. maybe a dinner on a friday yeah maybe there's some guests being invited around yeah, there's lots of differences. There's going to be one large table, usually. Only just brought in was the idea of promiscuous seating, which is less interesting than it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> it simply meant that um, the dinner guests were sat uh, male, female, male, female. Whereas before that, at the end of the um, 18th century, you had men at one side, women at the other. This was a great ah, time of um, fascinating. civility. I suppose. But one of the things that was really important was behaving appropriately around women. And when it used to be men at one end, women at the other end, the men just got trashed (laughs) on alcohol. Mm -hmm. There was a big thing, you know, well, again, there's an echo still hanging around of it today of your masculinity and how much alcohol you can put away. So to address this, I mean, there's other reasons too, but to address this, promiscuous seating was brought in. So then you'd have two ladies sat either side of you and you need to rein yourself in. Oh, right. So this was a way of putting a bit of the the brakes on the men's wild drinking. Yeah, getting things polite. I mean, who knows? I mean, I don't know how well it worked, but that was the idea. Mm. Um, And and I can only imagine how how effective the brakes must have needed to be when you're talking about soldiers and sailors, as opposed to uh, other regular everyday kinds of men as well. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. And what what you also had, by the way, before I forget to mention it, um, is a different layout of the food. We're we're still in the time of eating our food uh, a la Francaise, French service. It's essentially like a buffet, but the buffet is put on the table that you're dining at. And you get three courses. Each course has lots of dishes to it. Right. If it's a really big table, 32, 40 dishes. Wow. And if you're really swish, no two dishes are the same. You know, it was considered, you know, really well, great. <laughs> if you could do all that, it would seem terribly cross now, I would think. Oh, I hope so now. Yeah. So, and, and there was less distinction between what you should have and when. There was a general pattern of things going more sweet as the courses came on. But typically, what you'd have is the first course of roast and poached meats, simple cooking, simple British cooking, even in America at that time. In America, the uh, books of uh, various people written uh, in the 18th century, Elizabeth Raffold, Eliza Acton, uh, were, being, were really popular in America. So they were really trying to replicate what was going, in, going on in England. So you had this amazing table, plain cooking, second course. You'll have some more roast things and poached things, but you'd have, in inverted commas, made dishes, which were more fancy and more influenced by French 
um, gastronomy and, and cooking. Ah, uh-huh. so th- things with home. sauces and fancy flavorings and stuff. Oh, that stuff, exactly, yes. Right, right. Uh, but tucked in there too would be things like steam puddings, cheesecakes, maybe a, a, a web of spun sugar, mm-hmm. you know, things that we would definitely save for the end of the meal. That was the second course. Oh, it gets removed. Third course, <laughs> a third course comes on, and that's the dessert course or the sweet course where it's really sweet stuff like confectionery and um, glacé fruits, that sort of thing, and cheese and biscuits. Okay. But when you get to the mid 19th century, a switch has been moved to Russian service, service à la Russe, where we have the familiar separate courses. Everything's plated out on the plate, people bring them in. Show it in front of you, which is what we're more used to today. They were very confused when they first switched to the different um, services because they were so used to having such a massive variety of food that you'd have these meals with 15, 16, 17 courses. <laughs> and they were so expensive because you had to, everyone had to have a plate and they had to have, if there was 15 courses, that's 15 plates. You had to have servants oh. to bring all the food in, to wash the dishes up. The only reason we changed from French to Russian service, because it was a bigger way to show off your wealth. Mm. Okay, fascinating, and it's, it's amazing how you know we think of our dining habits of you know putting all of the made dish onto a plate with you know with all the accompaniments. Mm. That's a relatively recent thing in our history. It's a, it's amazing. Yeah, in fact, you know what? I would say in America, you know, um, you know, I, I had two um, Thanksgivings there because <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I was there for two years, and I actually thought there's more of a hint of the old French service in America than there is in, in Britain. Because sitting down there, you know, you've got your turkey, you've got your cranberry sauce, you've got your pumpkin pie. I mean, all, yeah, and you can have it all at the same time. Uh, and you've got your sweet potato with the marshmallows on. I mean, don't get me started on that as a dish in <laughs> itself. <laughs> but you, in America, I would say, first of all, everything's on the table all at once for people to pick. Yeah. Something if a, if a dish is empty, you take it away and bring something else over. That used to be called a remove. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I would say America is more hanging on to some of those older British stroke English ways of dining than, than we do in, in Britain today, actually. Fascinating. It's funny, we were talking a little bit ago about this at, at this time, you know, kind of the difference between your, your social class and how well you ate. And I was, I was mm. reading a couple of different studies they actually went back and looked at sailors' bones and officers' bones versus women's oh, bones and and compared them to the bones of people on land, you know, whether in the country or in the mm-hmm. city, you know, kind of stuff. And they were saying that one of the fascinating things about the English Navy is that, you know, while it has, I think, in our books and some other places kind of gotten a bad name of, you know, all this horrific food that they were served on ships and, mm-hmm. to, you know, how in the world you gather food for this many people and these long sea voyages that in fact, they got a lot more protein that they got, you know, when they look at the bones and, and, and kind of what's left behind that the, the meals were probably, um, especially for those lower classes, much better on the, on the ships than they were on the land. <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, there was less, um, fresh stuff going around, but they'd worked out, well, they didn't know what vitamin C was, but they knew you had to keep, things fresh to stop people getting scurvy. Yeah. Um, so that, that was the main problem, of course, infamously. Uh, but yeah, they, they had really good rations. They, they had quite, they had pretty big meat rations. It was usually yes. salt beef. Yes. But, you know, we're talking, you know, probably, well, well over a pound a day. Oh, yeah, easily. I mean, yeah. yeah I, it, in fact, yeah, I mean, people ate a lot more meat, uh, a lot more fat, and much more salt. I mean, I've tried to make salt beef in the traditional way before people use sugar and it's just oh my goodness it's just so salty you know how people didn't just dehydrate instantly and get yeah. kidney failure well well we know <laughs> we know they had uh, yeah we, we know they had kid, kidney stones and bladder stones a lot and i think a large part of it is this particular feature of the diet uh, and gout as well yeah all the protein and all the acid in the food yeah absolutely one of the things I, I was searching your blog, Neil, for, mm-hmm. you know, any Royal Naval references. And, and fascinatingly, the, the only one I found was one where you had Samuel Pepys kind of oh, yeah. during the fire of London to preserve his Parmesan cheese oh, wine. Yeah. <laughs> wine. 
and the fact that he lived in a naval neighborhood. So he had a lot of help from from his neighbors doing that. But I was wondering, you, you mentioned in that blog how Peep's kind of diaries had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of cooking references. They had a lot about the culture of eating and all that there. And I was curious, um, I, I know you're, you know, you haven't read the O'Brien books yet, but mm-hmm. other portrayals of cooking and serving and eating food that are, you know, historically accurate or really interesting from your perspective? Well, when it comes to uh, historical fiction, um, being, or, or, or whether it's in a book or, you know, a film or TV show or anything like that, um, I usually get annoyed at <laughs> how wrong the representations what? are. <laughs> mm. uh, particularly when it comes to showiness. Things are usually more showy in fiction than in reality. Okay. I'll give you an example. Jelly. Jelly and flummery. Flummery is basically a jelly, but with milk in it, I suppose. Right. You, you see these tables with these kind of two foot high, massive jellies, you, you know, wobbling around and looking fantastic. That didn't happen because you can't make a jelly that big. Mm. <laughs> Certainly uh, not if you're making your own jelly from boiled down um, veal knuckles or, or pig's trotters or something like that. It just wouldn't be possible to make them. In fact, you know, a, a jelly, I mean, they put a lot of work into it, different layers and maybe fruits inside, but you're talking maybe, I don't know, Six inches high, ah. even at the, even at the poshest dinner table, um, but of course that doesn't happen. Wow! And with fiction, you're allowed to take these little it's artistic license to add these things. So to kind of answer your question, I don't really. So what I really like is the is what everybody else would find boring, and that's the hmm. minutiae of daily life because that's not what's captured. We all know what kings and queens ate at their coronation, blah, 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 whatever. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Then I think there's been a big shift in history these days because we're getting less interested in what kings and queens and prime ministers and presidents did. We want to know what we would have done. Mm. And I think, for me anyway, and I won't speak for anybody else, for me, that is just more exciting and more evocative than Mr. Darcy was eating or whatever, you know, his big mansion in a made-up a made-up made meal in a made-up mansion <laughs> from 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 sources closer to reality then have you, have you got a favorite regency era recipe that you like to to pass on or that we can check out maybe on your website yeah actually um well i mean i like the simple plain cooking there was always a war yep. between the old english plain roast and boiled meats by boiled meats they meant poached Gently poached, <laughs> which, oh, okay. which is, yeah. you know, obviously a nice yeah. thing. Um, there was a war between that and the French swish dishes that use loads of butter and cream and all that, that kind of stuff. So a lot of people just wanted some roast meat, a bit of a sauce and some veg. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm very much, you know, I, you know, the, it seems like simple cookery, but the devil's in the detail with that kind of food. Mm-hmm. And it's actually quite, it's a very highly skilled task. Some French sauce over some kind of meat or fish that can cover a multitude of sins. <laughs> Simple, plain cooking. Well, everything's out there, you know, for people to yep. see. And it very much is not simple. <laughs> and in, indeed not plain either. Um, so for me, you know, the bo- boiled meats <laughs> that we used to call them, poached chickens and turkeys are particularly good. But w- one of the things which I just found absolutely delicious and I was so dubious about making and it's mutton or, or lamb to eat as venison and that requires a whole leg of lamb or mutton uh, and you marinate it for about a week in vegetables red wine red wine vinegar and a few herbs and spices and things and then you braise it for a few hours you take it out and it is the most delicious thing you've ever eaten in your entire life wow somehow the, the leg of lamb I used in that that week of marinating is transformed into a leg of venison, which normally, because if you want a leg of venison to serve up, you know, you'd have to remortgage your house. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> certainly in this country anyway. And it's one of the best things I've ever, ever eaten. The recipe for that's on, on my blog. I think I just call it mutton to eat like venison on BritishFoodHistory.com. But then, of course, there's all the amazing puddings. I mean, it's the century of puddings you know, the 19th century. They got going the previous century, but they we got it down to a fine art. 
Well, no, it's, it's funny you mentioned puddings. Mm. I mean, yeah, the, 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 there's, there's a there's a whole companion recipe book uh, written by a Patrick O'Brien fan called Lobscouse and Spotted Dog. Mm. Um, lots of listeners have tried some of those recipes. The ones that Good. seem to be popular that people stick with seem to be uh, pudding slash dessert recipes. Mm. Have you have you come across Lobscouse and Spotted Dog? Have you got got any commentary for us on which one of those sounded particularly appealing or particularly um, relevant to you? Well, yeah, I mean, I had a I had a look through, and yeah, I mean, there's loads of excellent recipes, pudding recipes in there, um, and well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Christmas pudding and plum duff. I mean, unless you've made an 18th or 19th century recipe, um, Christmas pudding. I mean, a Christmas pudding is basically a plum duff with a bit of extra booze in. Ah. <laughs> yeah. There's never any plums in plum duffs or in Christmas puddings. <laughs> They're an erroneous term for some reason. Also called figgy pudding sometimes, and there's never any figs in them either. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah, funny thing that yeah, every fruit except figs are in there. Yeah, call it I think the idea yeah. was because it was back in the day when you cooked things in a in a pudding cloth. So you had the big kind of Charles Dickens esque mm-hmm. cannonball shaped pudding, which would be boiling away for twelve hours or something because it'd be so big. Uh, it. it some people say it looked like a big fig, like a big ripe fig when you cracked open. Because it has a skin. When you, when you make... So that, these are the things that you don't realise. When you're making something in a cloth, so it doesn't leak out of the cloth, you know, the, the runny mixture, the batter, you have to line your cloth with loads of flour and then pop it in and then tie it up. So what when you take it out of your big pot and open it up it has like a skin around it hmm. like a pale skin and you break it open and all this you know delicious you know um soaked fruits spill out so i think that might be why it's called a figgy pudding or a plum pudding because it just looks like a giant dried fruit that's my theory <sighs> I'm I'm getting hungrier and hungrier as we're sitting. <laughs> but I, ne- I would never have come up with that theory had I never tried it, tried to make oh. it. Because it's those things that you don't think about when you just try to imagine making it. So what I would say to people is to have a go at making historical recipes and not worry too much about it, scoring a 10 out of 10 for authenticity, because it won't. Right. <laughs> So are puddings quite popular with your listeners, would you say? They've been mentioned a lot. What do you, what do you think, Mike? Uh, certainly the idea of suet puddings, mm. um, drowned baby, spotted dick, these kind of big heavy <laughs> suet puddings seem to have yeah. a really deep-seated appeal for readers of the O'Brien canon. What do you think? Oh, Mike? absolutely. And then every Sunday for the, you know, for the, you know, the, the non-officers, the rest of the crew, it's plumbed up. Mm. And that's, you know, one mm-hmm. of the things that everybody is absolutely looking forward to. So, you know, the main yeah. guys favorite food are puddings and, and the crew's favorite food pudding yeah i mean it's you know puddings are one of the few great levelers you know everybody would be tucking into a some kind of pudding even if it was one that was just flour beef suet and uh, a bit of milk or water and maybe some treacle on it nice mm. yeah so that's just a very cheap one you know somebody of lower the uh, lower classes might be eating but going through the list i mean i, I really liked uh, a lot of the recipes in that book, um, the syllabub yeah. um, stood out, especially the syllabub from the cow. Now I've not made that, <laughs> <laughs> but that comes from a fantastic book uh, by Elizabeth Raffold uh, called The Experienced English Housekeeper, uh, 1769. Um, oh. And her and a couple of other people, women who were writing in the 18th century, um, they created the blueprint for what would be what we think of as now traditional British food. Before that, you know, we're going back to Tudors and Stuarts and Tudors and further back into medieval times. It was very much class-based and court-based. You know, the upper classes were eating what other people in the upper classes were eating. So somebody in medieval England was, you know, a, a king or a lord was eating exactly the same stuff as somebody, I don't know, in Italy. <laughs> It was a very different relationship with our foods. Puddings became a real great leveler and everybody was everybody was eating them. And the idea that any class could eat similar foods. Okay, there was still expensive food and still cheap food, but um, it, it, uh, there was an overlap. In the Venn diagram of what made upper class food and lower class food, 
there became a bigger and bigger, you know, intersection. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. So I, and I guess maybe it goes with, with, with education and people become aware of each other's environments a bit more. And they're curious about what, uh, what all the other people in society are eating. And, uh, are cooking. yeah. And the pressure of course, for suppliers uh, or producers to drop their prices, ah, you know, right. th- there's always somebody willing to buy somebody else out, you know, so they yeah. could increase their production and sell things more cheaply. You know, there's always somebody around who's going to do that. <laughs> always someone so there, there was that too yeah. that trickle down Neil you've had this you know amazing kind of journey you know to go from evolutionary biologist to all the work that you're doing with food and cooking now and and this in this historically informed way what what's going on with you now what's next what's coming up well um I am just going through the kind of first copy proofs of my next book my first book a dark issue of sugar was released earlier in the year Congratulations! and next year a book title not 100 percent decided <laughs> um is a book a biography of um, elizabeth ruffled Ooh. somebody that no one's heard of and somebody who should really be a household name like i don't know mrs beaton or something like that uh, you know, everyone that should have at least heard of her, <laughs> but no one has, no one has. She was an amazing, an amazing woman. So it's, she had a big rise and fall um, narrative, I suppose, to her life. So I spent a, a, essentially a year in Manchester libraries going through microfilms. They have 18th century newspapers on microfilms, which is fantastic. Amazing. She advertised her books or, or her restaurant or her shop. She had various businesses through that and uh, her her personal thoughts don't exist you know diaries and things mm. they're all captured in these adverts that she puts in <laughs> into newspapers so I've, I've kind of pieced together her life and and death and her legacy which was huge i kind of mentioned her and somebody else called uh, hannah glass who came a little bit before her mm. um, yeah they created tr- traditional british food by the time you're getting into the 1810s, 1820s, really famous books, usually written by men, have just plagiarized women like Elizabeth's books and just put it in their books and passed them off as their own recipes. I mean, there was a different viewpoint of what plagiarism was and wasn't at the, at the time. But soon, you know, you get to the mid 19th century and Mrs. Beaton edits her book. She didn't write the book, <laughs> edited her book. She just stole everybody's recipes and there was never any need to buy any other, any other book than hers. So she just blew everyone else out of the water in the 1860s. So it's a rise and fall story that she had in life and then a rise and fall story from her work in death. A double, double whammy. <laughs> so that's what it's about. Um, no, I couldn't believe anybody had written a book on her um, because she has got, she, she just had an amazing life indefatigable would be the word to describe her wow wow great stuff so we can already pick up the dark history of sugar we should Mm -hmm. look out for a book coming about elizabeth raffold yes hopefully it should be easter time (laughs) next year Ah. 2023 oh nice oh fantastic well and meanwhile where can people go find your blog where can they find out more about your work right now go to my blog yeah britishfoodhistory.com uh that's my blog but i've added all sorts of extra pages there i also have a podcast too i'm just releasing my fourth season of my podcast the british food history podcast you can find links to that there as well and i'm always adding new posts i've got another blog the original blog neil cooks grigson where i cook all the recipes i still haven't cooked all the recipes after 15 years wow. <laughs> there's five stragglers that are particularly tricky brilliant Neil, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really fascinating to talk about history down the ages. It's been really fascinating to talk about history and society and you know things that we've seen lots of reflected in the books as well. Um, fascinating. We we hope we can convince you one day to dip your toe into reading the books of Patrick O'Brien because I think you might really like them. You might really like them, especially the show going action, and you'll spot some of these great food references in there as well. Um, thanks once again for coming on from the Lubbers Hole, and uh, we hope we see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thanks, Neil. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the interview. We've taken quite enough of your time already today with all of this, so we think that you might want to take a moment to check in on your figgy pudding about now. So let's take a short break, and we'll be right back to assess our conversation with Neil and move on with the chapter after this short break. 
If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back from the break. It was great to explore the social and culinary context of Regency cooking and eating habits. We noticed before we left there to, for that great interview, there were some pretty dark undercurrents in the dinner party that Jack and Stephen had just taken part of. So we're, we're going to go back into the action right after the dinner party has broken up. They're watching the boats pull away. And, and Jack says it was a most unsuccessful dinner. Dinners are delicate and one man can ruin them. And they, they're watching Horseflesh as he you know, heads out on his boat and he's vomiting constantly over the side of his boat. And Stephen says that this guy is a gross fellow who cannot hold his wine. And Jack asks if the invalids, meaning the, you know, the, the folks, the patients in the sick berth, have to eat that dreadful soup. And Stephen says, look, that soup was made four times too strong. It was attempted to be disguised with some decayed swine flesh, and then they burn it on top of that. So, you know, that, that soup is not the soup the invalids eat. But Stephen points out it's not the soup that's making Goppin sick. It's the black color. And so, Ian, you've talked to us before about this humors theory, right? That, you know, yeah. held sway for, for a very long time. What's Stephen talking about here? Great question. He's talking about black collar, C-H-O-L-E-R. Collar being uh, one of the four humors in Galenic medicine. Medicine, according to the theory of the, uh, the, the scholar Galen. Black bile, which is one amongst the others being blood, phlegm, and yellow bile, each each of them having their characteristic. The characteristic of black collar is melancholic, and the word melancholy itself is a compound of melanos, the Greek for black, and collar, the word for bile. So black bile, I think we talked about it back in 13 Gun Salute. The in Galenic theory, the organ that governs black bile is the spleen, of which we've heard quite a lot about in the last book or two. So I think that's the connection that we're trying to see here. But m- maybe besides the four humors. And, and black bile in particular, O'Brien might be digging in for something even deeper. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, yeah. That that you know, if you if you go back to these humors theory, you know, there's a number of things that are also related to each of the humors, and one of the ones related to this, you know, melancholy and black bile and color is aging. That you know, one becomes more melancholic as one ages. So. You know, we know that Jack is always concerned about aging, and I think we're going to see it creep in here a little bit. But as the dinner shows, he and Horseflesh, though both are aging, are very, very different people. Yeah. And maybe, maybe, you know, we might get be able to get something out on the uh, on the social media that gives you this bigger overview of the four humors Um you know, this this all sounds a little bit too much, but it's interesting. If you dig back into the research and some of personality theory, all of it seems to come back to fours. So yeah, I think some people haven't gone too far from some of this foundation. <laughs> true, true. Uh, even so, Jack empathizes with Horseflesh Goffin. He remembers how he, Jack, felt when he was off the list how he had wrecked parties with his gloom before he learned to, in air quotes, have previous engagements. He noticed how attached a man can be to the Navy after 20 years, attached to its order, its customs, its laws, even its clothes. And Horseflesh was close to 30 years in, in terms of his naval career, and five places above Jack in seniority on the post-captain's list. And Stephen takes all of this in. He says, well, yes, and yet he broke one of its laws. And another nice little moment for Jack to pull his worldview together for us here. Yes, says Jack false muster but i meant it's important laws instant obedience high discipline exact punctuality cleanliness and so on i have always thought them of the first importance and now that i am back i thank god for it every day i have still more respect for them and even for the lesser rules too discipline is all of a piece said saint vincent and i do not think i could bring myself to put anyone's name on the books and now, now the tone changes for the end of the, uh, the sentence here. Unless indeed your daughter should prove a son with a taste for the sea. <laughs> so for for all we're getting, Jack explaining the difference between him and Horseflesh Goffin. Actually, in some respects, they're still the same. Right. 
Right. Well, Pullings reports that they've, they've parted company and says to Jack that the people would really take it kindly if Jack went around the ship. And Jack says, oh, yeah, you know, I plan to do that as soon as we get underway. And Tom says, well, they'd really love it if you did it square rigged, meaning, you know, in your official uniform here. Mm. And O'Brien tells us how attached Jack is to the crew, how attached the crew is to him, how much the crew appreciates the prizes, uh, the way Jack has arranged this protection from impressment as a letter of mark, and how much they love his very public restoration to the Navy list, this you know, this gold lace splendor of a post captain really restores respectability to the ship and to her people, you know, these crew. The privateersmen aboard, they continuously enjoy being free from the criticism that most privateers endure. You know, they're a lot like pirates, not much far from it. And they love this new status symbolized by Jack's Nile medal hanging, you know, from his you know, uniform there. They love his number one scraper up there on his head. And everyone loves this relative freedom and equality that they have, kind of like a letter of mark more than a kingship, yeah. while still having the honor and glory of the king's service here. And when you take all that and couple it to the great prize money and rewards that they're getting, you know, everybody is dying to have Jack make his official entrance back on the surprise. And I, I think Jack is looking forward to it as well. Like the, the, this chance to make a connection again to this family. We've talked before about how naval ships companies are families. Right. Um, it's not going to be straight away though. Jack tells Tom he's going down to cool off. He'll come and see the people when the ship is underway. And Jack asks Stephen to come down with him and get out of the heat. And uh, St- Stephen's still on this slightly sarcastic kick here with Jack. He says, sobriety and moderation preserve me from plethory. They preserve me from discomfort in what, after all, is but a modest warmth. Um, Jack is uh, not having any of this. Well, sobriety and moderation are capital virtues, and I have practiced them from my earliest youth, said Jack. And in brackets, may you be forgiven. Anyway, said Jack, but they are sadly out of place in a host who must encourage his guests to eat and drink by example. So there is a Roland for your, um, for your, uh, and he can't finish off the reference. <laughs> so what, what kind of a Roland is he digging for here, Mike? Yeah. So, you know, the phrase is, so there is a Roland for your Oliver, which, which means to give as good as one gets here. So, you know, you know, you, you've kind of given me a stinger. I've given you a stinger back. You know, it, or sometimes it also means kind of a quid pro quo. It's from the song of Roland, you know, uh, this great French ballad originally about Roland and his companion Oliver, these kind of, you know, great friends, great comrades in arms here. And, you know, it's funny because at first it's not there. And, you know, we can see that Jack's still reaching for it because a little while later in his cabin, Jack asks Killick if he's ever heard of Roland and Killick is giving a few. And how about Oliver and Roland and Oliver? And so, you know, given this, I suspect that, uh, you know, POB is trying to, a uh, uh, POB, I mean, Patrick O'Brien, is, is trying to, you know, give us a few things here. I don't know enough about Roland and Oliver, but I suspect O'Brien is pointing us in the direction of these many songs and odes to say, there's probably some fascinating parallels to Jack and Stephen, but I'm not scholar enough to pull them out here. No, uh, me neither. It's going to be worth a look, though. I think we can take we can take a look at that sometime. That'd be fun. Yeah. Now, as Jack's resting, waiting for the ship to get underway so he can do his tour, he's trying to remember all the people that he's going to encounter, everyone who was on the ship when he left it in Portugal. There's been so much going on since he came over from the nutmeg that he hasn't talked with many of them yet. He falls off to sleep, but his sleep is troubled. Not by horseflesh goffin, not by Stephen's finances, but by the idea that he might not remember someone's name. He knows how important it is to them, and he believes that it's a captain's and officer's duty to know the names of all the people under his command. It's a very, very telling bit of Jack's leadership that he falls asleep worrying about that and not the other things. Now, Reed wakes Jack, sending Mr. West's duty and the report that the nutmeg has hoisted the signal permission to part company. Jack says to reply, affirmative and Merry Christmas, which is our our one hint that this is a seasonal episode. Um, Reed also reports that a man named Davis, hmm, Mm. a man named Davis had fallen overboard just as the surprise was about to fish the best bower. 
They're just holding back in. And Jack wants to say that they could heave Awkward Davies back into the ocean, but didn't. Half a glass later, the same Jack is shaking Davis's hand with real pleasure. Uh, all the crew's really happy to see the captain, but they feel a bit more reserved with him in his full naval glory once more, with the 100-guinea presentation sword, with the Turkish chalenk in his hat. So they're putting much of their welcome into the handshakes, and we get this image of Jack's hand, you know, the bones in his hand being crushed as he goes around shaking hands with all these hearty seamen guys. Um, everyone's name, good news, comes effortlessly until Jack gets to the cannon sudden death, surrounded by six faces, six profoundly bearded faces. I might. This is the Sethians. Right. The, the beard is enough of a hint. The names come to him and he greets them. Slade says that Jack Auden had lost two toes in Tierra del Fuego and John Brampton had sinned with a woman in Tahiti and is still in the sick berth. Jack offers his sympathies and hopes that it's been a prosperous voyage. And the Sethians are always on the lookout for a bit of gold leaf for their Sethian temple. Say, well, it's not up to you Nebuchadnezzar pitch like their first cruise, but Seth has been very good to us. And of course, Mike, all you Old Testament scholars know that Nebuchadnezzar was the richest king of the East, king of the Babylonians, when they defeated Israel and Egypt and some others as well. Well, Jack visits everyone on the ship by himself. You know, he doesn't he doesn't take his lieutenant with him. He's going up there and he's finishing. He's made his way all the way through and he's coming through the hot and smelly gloom to the sick berth, the text says. You know, he learns that the surprise had only lost five hands in her entire cruise and that under Tom Pullings, she is a very happy ship. But, you know, as as he's kind of, Going through this in his mind, he's kind of thinking the stench at the Orlop seems just a little bit too much. So Jack goes in, he visits the two patients. Wilkins has got a broken arm that won't heal. And then, as, as the text says, the simpler Brompton brother with the Tahiti pox, so the other Sethian, oh, yeah. who's now too ashamed to move or speak. Jack asks Martin, and he says, look, th this isn't meant to be a personal reflection on you, uh, you know, Mr. Martin or Captain Pulleys. But, but isn't the atmosphere sort of uncommon, thick, and unwholesome here in the sick berth? And, and then he turns to Stephen Matron. You know, he says, you know, what do you think? You know, and Stephen says, well, I do too, but I'm in an opinion that this is no more than the ordinary atmosphere, the ordinary fetter of an aged man of war. Ah, and Stephen goes on to explain it's the product of years and years and years of the hands relieving themselves in various parts of the ship rather than going up to the head and tons of vile slime from slaughterhouses and human habitation, which come aboard the cables and they, they drip into the spaces below all these spaces, which are never cleaned. Yeah. And, and we kind of, you know, we heard a little bit about this in the previous chapter too. Well, Stephen then goes on to tell Martin how he and the captain had been sailing on the nutmeg, which smelled so sweet because she'd been washed in the sea extensively before they got her. And his theory is that he and Jack have grown delicate noses from their time on board the nutmeg. Um, <laughs> Jack, for his part, though, says, I'm going straight up on deck and having another wind sail shipped. <laughs> well, we, we had a little bit of foreshadowing in the last chapter about you know, how sweet the atmosphere was in the bilges on the nutmeg, and now we're getting the contrast with right. the sticky old surprise. Ah, <sighs> um, Jack, meanwhile, tells Brampton the Sethian to cheer up. He says, "Other men have been in far worse shape. You're in good hands." And Brampton says, "The woman tempted me, and now I'll go to hell." And ha! Huh, how many years since the Book of Genesis, Mike? of men been trotting out the line the woman made me do it <laughs> right <laughs> pretty lame uh, anyhow that's all jack's got to offer really to poor old brampton stephen and martin think about it a bit longer they're debating whether there's anything they can do for brampton either for the for his malady for the illness that he's carrying or for his sense of shame for the malady really they're, they're pretty close to a placebo they can offer an evil smelling slime draft one made evil smelling with the addition of two scruples of asafetida. And for his shame, the best they can do for now is to offer to let him stay isolated in the sick bay away from the uh, embarrassing remarks and observations of his shipmates. Before they can finish with the patients, fresher air is blowing down from the new wind sail. Thank you, Captain Albury. And when they reach the quarterdeck, they hear Jack telling Pullings, 
Remarks have been passed about the charnel house cesspit stink between decks, so perhaps we better open the sweetening cock. And Jack sends Oaks and Reed to find the carpenter to learn how to turn on the sweetening cock, which is a little valve for letting water in from the sea, and have it left on until there's 18 inches of water in the well. That means more pumping in the heat, but as Jack says, it will clean the bilges like a milkmaid's pail. And Mike, we're not sure really whether this is an allusion to the Aesop's fable of the milkmaid's pail, the moral of which is don't count your chickens before they're hatched, or is it just a minor Aubreyism? You know, perhaps we'll never know. But it's certainly seen as a bit of a fling, uh, and a fling perhaps in the direction of Stephen and Martin. Yeah. And, and if it is intended that way, you know, Stephen and Martin don't hear it because they're already a whale off in search of privacy so that they can catch up with each other on what's going on. Despite missing Stephen since their party in Portugal, Martin seems to have done very well aboard the surprise. Ask about his exploits. Stephen wonders, hmm, what are the three things that cannot be concealed? Love, sorrow, and wealth are the three things that cannot be concealed. And intelligence work comes a very close fourth. Yeah. And so he tells Martin the story of negotiating the treaty with the Sultan and Pulo Prabang with no mention of the intelligence work part of it. A little of what he saw on the island, things like the flowers, the orchids, the rhinoceros, the, you know, the ape, and the journey there in the Diane, all the things that Stephen wanted to see but couldn't. He rounds off the story with the monsoon, the island, the escape to Batavia, and the nutmeg. And then Stephen asks about Martin, how he's been. And Martin says that this time, instead of being bitten by an owl-faced night ape in the Brazilian forest, he was bitten by a tapir that he tried to help pull out of a pit. So he's a little incensed that that's what he got for his troubles. And you know, when he did this, it was much to the chagrin of some local Indians who'd probably dug the pit and they were stabbing at him with their spears until luckily some of the crew members stopped and uh, helped Martin out and stopped the Indians. And Martin takes that time to mention that some of the lime juice aboard might be dubious and that this one crew member's unhealing bones, you know, that they had just looked at in the sick berth might be a sign of scurvy. Ah, so it seems that perhaps Stephen's own citrus juice supplies will be needed and perhaps a topping off with a visit ashore. Mm. Scurvy's never far away when you're this far distant from home, when you're in these kind of climates here. Let's, right. see, what, let's see what's going to become of this inherent need for extra citrus juice here. They hear the striking of eight bells. Stephen realizes that he's late and he invites Martin to supper. Martin asks to be excused and looks anxiously down as he's climbing through the lubber's hole. And they're doing this in the dark. Mike, if we'd known they were visiting, we would have left the lights on, right? <laughs> so Stephen wishes he could stay up and would if he wasn't engaged to eat with the captain. And Martin, it seems, would like a lantern. But Stephen doesn't want to appear unseamanlike. And as, as I'm hearing them having this little back and forth, I'm thinking one of these two characters is going to fall and break their neck. I can tell, no, you know, I can feel that there's a, there's a physical comedy moment coming, but we managed to avoid this. Martin notes that a seaman named Wilkins had fallen from here to break his arm. Wilkins was drunk, he said, but the height is much the same. <laughs> Stephen encourages them to show more than merely Roman fortitude, meaning stoicism. He says that gravity and perhaps St. Brendan will help them. A great reference to St. Brendan, um, an early Irish monastic saint. Brendan had a legendary seven-year voyage, is the patron saint of boatmen, mariners, sailors, travellers, and whales. And the two do finally make it down out of the rigging. Stephen, clumsily, not waking, waiting for the role, and Martin does it, does it just a little better. Well, you know, once he gets down, Stephen heads into the cabin. He apologizes to Jack for being late, saying he's been in the mizzen top since before sunset. Jack says, that nah, doesn't bother me. I, I didn't wait. He asks Stephen if he'd like wine or raving for punch. And Stephen chooses punch. You know, he says, you know, he had that great big dinner. And he comments on Jack's nice toasted cheese dish, this thing that he's cooking the toasted cheese in. And Jack says, oh, yeah, you know, I ordered it from that man that you suggested in Dublin, but I forgot about it and I never took it out of the box. Hmm. Stephen, still admiring it, says... It is the long road you've come, Jack, that you can forget a hundred guineas or so. Yeah. So kind of an interesting thing, given their two change in fortunes here. 
that he's saying, you know, yeah, Jack had spent a hundred guineas in this thing and then forgot he even had it. And then they start talking together animatedly about, you know, all the times when they were poor and miserable together. But after a while, Stephen notices a constraint in Jack. His massive laugh is gone. He's not looking at Stephen anymore. And they become silent. Yeah. And finally, Jack reports that he'd been round the ship to see how everyone was doing. He'd noticed that many of them were older. And this had reminded him that perhaps he too was older. And he says, when you spoke of the Barky as an aged man of war, it quite put me about. By, by the way, Mike, this is a little exchange between uh, Stephen and Jack that got picked up a little bit in the Master and Commander movie with Russell Crowe. Right. Anyway, in, in, in this, Jack goes on in a much more kind of reflective tone. He says, it was absurd in me to toss all these together in one gloomy pot. For although the Sethians may have grown beards a yard long, and although I no doubt ought to wear lean and slippery pantaloons, a ship and a man are different things. And Mike, I love this reference to lean and slippery pantaloons. I, I wonder if it's also a bit of a reflection on Patrick O'Brien's own stage of life. Let, let's read this quote from Shakespeare's As You Like It, Act 2, Scene 7. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved a world too wide for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound. So, in this sixth age of man, the calf muscles wither and shrink, our hose, our trousers are therefore too wide, the vocal cords weaken, the manly voice becomes a childish shriek. Jack is clearly worried about the effects of his age. He's arguing that he shouldn't have let his feeling about age affect him, since a man and a ship don't age the same. They're two different things. And O'Brien would have been, what, 70-something, well yeah, into his 70s right. by the time he wrote this book. And uh, it's been a little while since Jack Orby reflected on aging, and I think it's, it's probably be pretty timely that it comes back to the top of his mind now. Absolutely. Well, I, I can say Jack and Patrick O'Brien, I resemble that remark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Stephen asked Jack if it's really different for a ship and a man, this aging. And, and Jack says it is. And he presents many examples of ships built well before Surprise, which are still spry, concluding, no, no, perhaps the Surprise is not one of your gym crack modern craft flung together with unseasoned timber by contract in some hole in the corner yard. She may have been built some time ago, but she is not old. And you know, who better? The improvements that have been carried out, diagonal bracing, reinforced knees, sheathing. And, and you know, Stephen <laughs> sort of stops him. He says, you speak quite passionately, my dear, protectively, as if I had said something disagreeable about your wife. Jack says, well, that's because I do, in fact, feel passionate and protective. I've known this ship so many years, man and boy, that I do not like to hear her blackguarded. And Stephen, I think Stephen's getting it now. He says, Jack, when I said aged, I referred only to the generations or ages of filth that have accumulated below. I did not mean to blackguard her any more than I should blackguard dear Sophie. God forbid. So, you know, I think Stephen and Jack have hopefully heard each other out here. Yes, and Jack notices that this is, you know, this is this is worth putting an end to. He says, I am sorry I flew out. I'm sorry I spoke so chuff. My tongue took the bit between its teeth so I was laid by the lee again, which is very absurd because I had meant to be particularly winning and agreeable. I had meant to say that, yes, there was a hundred tons of shingle ballast down there that should have been changed long ago, and after having admitted so much and said that we intended to open the sweetening cock and pump her cleaner, I was to go on and ask whether you would consider selling her to me. It would give me so much pleasure. And my, in amongst this beautifully turned paragraph, this beautifully friendly and open and warm and sensitive um, offer that's being made to his companion, Stephen. There's a little Aubreyism in there as well. Um, bit between the teeth. Tongue is really, st what's going on there? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it, it, he says, you know, my, my tongue took the bit between its teeth. A, a bit is in a horse's mouth. It puts pressure on the tongue to, to help control the horse. So the tongue doesn't take the bit between its teeth. The horse does. But 
you know, I can't help but think, as you say, it's an Aubreyism. And I think it's a little gentle nudge back to say horse flesh Gotham, Jack Aubrey, sometimes the same, a lot different. But, you know, here's Jack kind of going, you know, with a little horse flesh kind of a, yeah, yeah, I think I sort of overreacted there here. Very nice. Well, I, I love here how, you know, Jack's asked Stephen to sell the surprise to him here. And, and O'Brien, I love this because it's, you know, we're in the middle of this and it says, you know, O'Brien says that Stephen swallows his rebellious piece of cheese <laughs> that he's been chewing on for some time. And he says to Jack, very well. And then O'Brien writes that he's watching the decently restrained delight in his friend's eye. And he says that Stephen's wondering how Jack's eyes become so much more intensely blue at a time like this. And Jack asked Stephen if he'd like to name the price now or think about it. And Stephen says, well, Jack can just pay whatever Stephen paid for it, except he doesn't remember what that is. They'll just have to ask Tom Pullings, who did the bidding for Stephen. So, you know, so much like Stephen here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, well, you know, Jack's just recounted all these improvements they made to her. But Stephen's like, oh, you want to buy it? Sure. Give me what I paid for. And I have no idea what that is. Ask Tom. <laughs> it's great. And I'm sure that... It was not inevitable that Stephen would respond this way. I'm sure Stephen's had a bit of a think about this and he's yeah. looked at the situation and he's thought about his relationship with Jack and he's thought about really where he is in the world. And finally, his kind of sarcastic bitchy tone that he's had for a few paragraphs now is just like, yeah, okay, actually, this is a generous offer. So well spotted, well found, Stephen Maturin. Ah, so this calls for a bit of a moment here. Jack calls Killick and says, bring the doctor the best punch bowl and everything necessary. Then clear away his cello and my fiddle in the great cabin and place the music stand. Punch bowl it is, sir, said Killick. And the kettle is already on the boil, almost laughing as he spoke. And clearly, <laughs> Killick has been listening at the crack in the door here, is really glad that Jack is buying the ship. This news is going to travel quickly. You I betcha. Think. Yeah. Stephen asks Killick to bring the smaller keg, the one in the sailcloth jacket, from his cabin rather than the lemons for the punch. And after setting out the punch bowl and the ladle, they hear Killick and a mate cursing, bringing the keg along the half deck. Killick brings it in himself and says he didn't know the doctor had it with, with an odd mixture of admiration and resentment. <laughs> we know how much Killick likes to polish, protect, and brag upon, upon Jack and Stephen's things. So this, this oak barrel is clearly something that he wishes that he'd know more about and wishes that he had the chance to bring the polish up to a higher state of perfection. The oak barrel has these polished copper bands. It has the stamp Bronte Triple X or Bronte 30, I don't know which, and an engraved plaint to that eminent physician, Dr. Stephen Maturin, whose abilities are surpassed only by the gratitude of those who have benefited from them. And the signature is Clarence. Wow. Jack asks, can it be? And Stephen confirms that it's the triple refined Sicilian juice, a present from Prince William from his own estate. Prince William, Duke of Clarence, the brother of King George IV, who would himself later become King William IV. Stephen says he was keeping it for Trafalgar Day, but they'll drink a little tonight for this special occasion and as he says, drink the immortal memory. And that's where might we get to make the connection. Bronte, the dukedom of Bronte, is a Sicilian title that was granted to Nelson after the Battle of the Nile and after the king of Naples and Sicily had been so grateful to the British establishment and to Nelson in particular for keeping Napoleon at bay and his kingdom safe. So this is quite literally Nelson's juice that they're about to drink. Nice. As he mixes the drink, Stephen tells Jack that Martin, that valuable man, has spotted hints of scurvy aboard Jack's ship. Jack says, all hands say how lucky they are to have Martin. And Stephen continues, he suggested, and I heartily concur, that we should steer for some fruitful island. And there is no urgent necessity with what I have brought with me, but from the medical point of view, we should certainly have a relief at some halfway stage if ever you can find one in the limitless ocean. End of chapter seven. Oh, Mike, what, what, what a nice turn to the end of the chapter, but what an odd contrast the chapter is with the one that went before. Right, right. 
you know, you, you, you know, last chapter we had all this action and everything else. And here, you know, we've had this succession of fascinating character studies. Uh, we've had, you know, a real in-depth kind of look at the development of our heroes' characters and sort of looking back from where they used to be to where they are now and some head scratching about you know, perhaps where they're going to go. You know, we've got Stephen and Jack still with some remaining tension from time to time. And then this really kind of nice warm moment at the end here. You know, I kind of wonder, will there be any impact of this sale of the surprise? On, on the one hand, I remember Stephen, you know, loving the idea of all the journeys going to take with Martin on it after yeah. the war. Now thinking now that I don't have any money, I won't be taking those journeys. So, and, you know, as you say, you know, we could we could use the money. So I'll sell her to Jack here. Ah, gosh. And as, as well as that prospect, Mike, we've got the prospect of where are we going to go next on this journey? We're off to Sydney Cove. We have an island stop on the way. We're, we're O'Brien readers and we ask ourselves, what could have possibly go wrong? Right. Um, have we had enough go wrong already on this voyage? And can we simply be on our way? Uh, are we going to see horse flesh or strong preference here, the nutmeg <laughs> ever again? Right. Or are we going to be right. back solely aboard the surprise? The crew is glad to have Jack back. And now that he's a naval officer again, do the privateer shares still hold? What does this mean for the well-being and the fortunes of the crew? And what about this relatively equal, relatively democratic spirit on the surprise? How is that going to fare? Should we expect a detachment of Marines on the ship anytime soon? Yeah, it's, you know, this quiet moment of reflection after all that action, it, it really has me wondering, as we've talked about, what comes next? We know, because we peeked ahead, there's three chapters to go. So, Mike, I've got to ask you one more time. What do you say to a few more chapters of Patrick O'Brien? Oh, I should like that of all things. Bewitched for some of you. I, oh, I'm reaching yeah. back. I know, you know, I, I had a, a pretty strong, adult, you know, I guess it was pre adolescent crush on Elizabeth Montgomery. Any good witch fans out there will remember it's the name of Cassie's store in that Hallmark wow. thing. So, I'm, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big Cassie fan from <laughs> The Good Witch. Um, I, I love the references for the generations there. Mike, we get The Good Witch and we get Bewitched. Very good. Right. One, one, one for the teenagers and one for the not so teenagers. There you go. Oh, fantastic.